How big is your God? It's not like we get to vote on that. God just is who God is. Scripture is very clear on this, but how big do you allow God to be? Do you realize, maybe is a better way to put this question, do you realize how big God is? How glorious God is? When's the last time you thank God for creation? For making this beautiful blue planet that has just the right mix of air so that we can breathe and it gives life? that you were given a heart that beats and allows life-giving blood to move through your body, that, that, that as the camera pans all the way from the edges of the universe and just, you know, perceived universe, the best scientists say, well, the universe that we can observe is about 93 million light years, give or take a light year, I guess. But, but we know that there's so much more out there. We, we just know from what we've seen that there has to be like probably over a billion light years of universe, of expanse that's out there in a way that our minds can't fully even wrap around. How big is your God? That there'd be a God who scripture reveals creates everything in this universe, creates this beautiful blue planet, creates life. As the camera zooms into that woman's eye, you get into the retina and the red blood cells and the white blood cells and ultimately to the DNA and then even deeper, the, the life map of, of human life and then it comes back out. When's the last time you thank God for the way he made you, the way he put you together? Sometimes I think we get a, a little bit, oh, I don't know, arrogance, kind of a strong word for it, but a little prideful when it comes to who we are and who we imagine God to be. And we forget God's the God who makes life, who creates, who, who gives us the opportunity even to be here. And ultimately, what does this God, this creator of the universe owe us? The true answer and the one that's not all that easy to digest is really nothing. God doesn't owe us anything. God gave us so much already that if that's all there was to God, we'd already have so much to praise him for, so much to glorify him for, the majesty, the glory, the wonder, the, the, the awesomeness. And I don't mean that in a seventh grade junior high way. I mean in the literal definition of the word, how awesome God is. Just how absolutely majestic God is. How big is your God? Because when we put God in a little comfortable box and God gets too small, I think we lose. We lose so much. We, we, lose, we lose our whole point and purpose of life too. Because if God is really small and I tell God who God is, then God doesn't get to tell me who I am. And now I've committed original sin. And that takes us right into our Bible readings for this last week and our new sermon series for the season of Lent called The Heart of God. Our annual theme, if you're new here to Hope Today, and it looks like we have new people because we put in about 100 new seats this week. And now we have a few empty seats, but not, not so there's more room to invite your friends again. And turn to the person next to you and say, 930 has room again. That's kind of nice. We, we've got a little bit of space. Not a lot, but a little. We are a church after God's own heart. That's our annual theme this year. That's what the Bible says about David. That's why David is blessed. We want to be a church after God's own heart. So what does that mean? All throughout the season of Lent, in order to be a church after God's own heart, it's important that we know what God's heart consists of, what it's really all about. Not who we want it to be or who, what we say it is, but what scripture, the timeless wisdom and truth of scripture reveals. And what scripture reveals is better than all of our inventions anyway. When God spoke, the world began, it says in Psalm 33, it appeared at his command. Look at the glory and the wonder of God's creation. Josh Kaiser, our very own Josh, who's mixing the sound today for this service and has, has been the head of our production team here at Hope for 97 years. Uh, he, he's way too young for that. But he's such a talented guy. He goes out on his vacations and he finds places in the world because he's a photographer too. He, it, and we've got this beautiful picture he took in our living room, Sally and I do. The, the man's gifted. He's, he's got an eye for photography. And he took these all, these, all six of these photos. The heavens proclaim the glory of God, Psalm 19 says. And if we look at that and if we aren't careful, we start to think, well, what am I relative to all this? the grandeur of God's creation just here on earth. And then you zoom out and zoom out and zoom out to a billion or so light years away. What, what am I? I'm just, I'm just a little speck. Whatever campus or local site you're at or here in West Des Moines, turn to the person next to you right now and say, you're just a speck in God's universe. You're just, you're just a, a little flick. That, that's all you are. 
<laughs> You're like, well, I'm so glad I came to church today to hear that. I'm feeling pretty puny now. But then Psalm 8 balances all that out and reminds us, yeah, but that speck is the highlight of God's creation, you. The human race, humankind is the highlight of God's creation according to what scripture reveals. When I look at the night sky, God, and I, I see the work of your fingers, what are mere mortals, the, us little specks? Well, it goes on to say, we are human beings that you choose to take care of. You made us only a little lower than God, than yourself, and crowned us with glory and honor, and you've given us charge over everything you made, putting all things under our authority. We're, we're your stewards, your managers, the people that you call to preside over this beautiful blue planet that you've created. What are we in, in the glory and the grandeur and the majesty of your creation? We're really, truly valuable specks, and not just that. You created us in our inmost being. You knit us together in our mother's wombs. We praise you then. When's the last time you praised God for making you, for giving you life, for giving you uh, the ability to see if you can see, to hear if you can see, to smell, to touch, to taste, to experience life with your senses, to, to, to breathe it all in, to have community, to have friends, to have connections, to have love, to, to be able to share, to have a purpose, to have a mission, to, to, to be community together as a church. I praise you for all of it that you've created, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. And yes, that is our granddaughter who was born a month ago, and I just praise God for her. When you hold that little life in your arms and you realize just how much you immediately love her, you give God glory for that. Genesis 1:27, the first chapter of the Bible gets even more specific. It says in Latin, you're the Imago Dei, but the original text of Genesis 1 isn't Latin, it's Hebrew. And so it says, Selem Elohim. And if you're having trouble reading that, remember, uh, it's, it's because Hebrew isn't read left to right, it's right to left. That's what's tripping you up. So now you're seeing it come into fruition. You're the Selem Elohim. You are the image of God. You are the likeness of God. No matter who you are, your picture belongs up on this screen. You were created by the God who loves you. You are created in God's likeness, in God's image, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what your story, no matter what your heritage, your ethnicity, your, your race, it doesn't matter. You're a part of this human race and you are made, every single one of us, every single one of you, in the image of God. Salem Elohim, Imago Dei. What does that mean? That God created human beings in his own image? That he touched us with this spark of his spirit? That he fills us up with this spirit? As Michelangelo so famously tried to paint on the ceiling of, of, of the Vatican Chapel, it, it means that we reflect God wherever we go and whatever we do. Like last week during the Super Bowl food drive. You heard it during the announcements and in the Hope 360 video. You're a generosity, absolutely overwhelming. Every food pantry we could find in central Iowa now has their shelves stocked with food because of you, because of your generosity. That's 121. I think I've got that count right. Two semis just in the West Des Moines campus alone. Then add all of our other campuses and local sites. You are reflecting the image of God. You are living it out for this creation. So we have a responsibility as the stewards, the managers of God's creation, to bless this creation, to be the image of God, to be the body of Christ. Christ, the New Testament says, is the perfect image of God, and he calls us, even in our sinfulness, even in our imperfections and our flaws, to be the body of Christ in the world today. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is who you are. It isn't about us striving to become something because you get a pep talk from a preacher to try to be more than you could possibly be. Give 110%. That's not what scripture says. It just says, just be who God made you to be. Just remember who you are. Don't get distracted. Don't forget. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't let anybody shame you because you're not like them. Or you maybe don't see the world the way they see it. You 
are made in the image of God. You are the Imago Dei, and we are called to reflect faithfully that image. And when we do things like the Super Bowl food drive, or when we partner with our missionary in Ghana, Pastor Sam, who's here, and who you heard during the announcements, we are reflecting the image of God. Behind me, you see four poles, and you might be thinking, what are those doing here? Well, these poles are going to be the, the, the beams upon which a whole replica of a church in Ghana that we're trying to build out there will be built during the season of Lent. As we donate, we'll build more and more of this church building to remind us that we are on a mission from God to reflect the image of God to the world around us, to make heaven more crowded, to do what we can to plant these seeds of hope, to be a church after God's own heart, to spread God's word, his life-saving, life-saving word, his eternal destiny-changing word. What could possibly be more important? And just $4,000, your, 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 your small group could build a whole church. Or, or maybe those of you who are blessed with a lot of resources and money, you, you could build a whole church or two or three. Pray about it. Give as God calls you and leads you to give. As you heard from Pastor Sam, you've already built over 600 churches in villages and towns where there weren't any Christian churches before. As you heard from him, tens of thousands of people, somewhere around, what, 50,000 people are showing up for worship in the churches that you built in the churches that you funded, that, that you were the reflection, the imago day of God. That's what it means to reflect God's image. But it isn't just reflecting it to creation. It's representing creation, doing what we're doing here today, praising God, praising God for his creation, praising God for his redemption, praising God for his amazing grace, which we so desperately need. Because we turn the page a little deeper into Genesis 1 and we realize, okay, the story starts to transition into Adam and Eve. From the six days of creation to here's these first two human beings that God made. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. It is the pinnacle of his, his creation, the last thing he made on the last day of his creation. I know, I, we probably need to pause real briefly here because some of you are new. People are like, yeah, the last day. How does that fit with scientific uh, revelations that say it didn't take six days, it took billions and billions of years and it, it, took, it took a long time. And, and, and so how are we supposed to justify that? And, and let's get into a war over that. Let's get into a theological fight of that. Let's be dismissive and demonize the other side on that. The Hebrew word for day in Genesis 1 is an indeterminate amount of, indetermined amount of time. Later on, that same word in the New Testament, it says the day could be like a thousand years, a thousand years could be like a day. A thousand years literally in the original Greek of the New Testament doesn't mean literally a thousand years. It means like the biggest number you could get. So each of those days, and then if you look at the sequence of what science says, how creation came to be, and you line that up, now I'm not saying it all perfectly aligns, but it certainly doesn't completely disagree. Far from it. Quite the opposite. That scripture tells us who did it and why it was done. And science, like Einstein famously said, I'm a scientist because I want to figure out what God's done. I'm not God. I'm just trying to figure it out. And Oppenheimer, which is kind of hot these days, right? He's just trying to figure out what to do with what God has created. So here we have faith and science actually coming together. And science is a subset of, a, of an even deeper truth from a God of creation. I mean, again, humbly, science can only take us so far into this universe. And then it says, beyond that, we don't know. We don't know. We're just, you know, looking. We're trying to figure out more and more as we go. I find that exciting and fascinating. I have a daughter who's a scientist. She's married to a scientist. We're very pro-science. You don't have to be. It is a myth. I said this to our Power Life Confirmation kids a couple of Wednesdays ago. I said, you will be told you either have to believe in faith, in God, or you have to put your faith in science, and you can't do both. That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is a lie. You can put your trust in the God who creates this universe and does so. And any fifth grader who reads Genesis 1 to 3 for the first time without any bias will tell you, oh, the point of Genesis 1 to 3 is not how long it took God to make everything. The point of Genesis 1 to 3 is God is really big. God is really good. 
and his creation is very good, and human beings are the highlight. And then we kind of messed it up. We, and I say we, you're like, Yo, we, I didn't mess it up. Don't blame me, it was them. It was Adam and Eve, and a lot of men say, especially Eve. She's the one, that, the woman made me do it. That's what, that's actually what Adam is quoted as saying when God says, did you bite into the, oven? she made me do it. I won't say typical man, but if I did, you could go ahead and laugh about that too. There's a, there is a story here that isn't just a story about Adam and Eve, it's a story about you and me. So are you saying it's just symbolic? No, I'm not. I think there was an Adam and Eve. I think they're the first people God made. I think there was a Garden of Eden, this paradise on earth. But I also know that in Hebrew, Adam's name means mankind. It means all of us. Adam and Eve. In the image of God, he created them. Both Adam and Eve, male and female, he created them. Not just the man and then there's the woman who's secondary. But God created male and female in his image. Then God blessed them and said, part of the reason, a big part of the reason, I make you male and female so that the opposites can come together. And a man and a woman can fall in love and have a union called a marriage and the two can become one which will bless their marriage and they can also be fruitful and multiply. And then life will continue, to, human life will continue to persist generation after generation after generation. So I made you male and female for this reason. Be fruitful and multiply. People are like, oh, that's just Old Testament. What? Jesus never said anything about the definition of marriage. Yeah, those are people who haven't read Mark 10 or Matthew 19. Jesus says God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. And this explains why we have marriage, why a man is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Be careful here. Be very, very careful here. Because you might be hearing that and be like, ha, yeah, that's right. The problem is these people who have this wrong view. That's the problem in our world. People who take the wrong view on all these issues of our day, and if they didn't, this would be a better world. Make no mistake about it, immorality certainly exists in our world today. People going their own way, counter to God's will and God's revelation and God's teaching in Scripture, all true, all true. In some ways, our immorality is off the rails. But if you know human history, you know this isn't the first time. It's not like it's worse now than ever before. It's been bad and sometimes worse throughout all of human history if you actually have read history and know history. And I'm sure most of you have, if not almost all of you. So let's just take, you know, pump the brakes as they say, slow our roll a little bit, and ask ourselves, is the main purpose of reflecting the image of God that we win arguments? That we win the social issue battles of our day? Is that the primary mission of the church? Is that a church after God's own heart? Is that what it means to be courageous? That we stand against all the immorality in this world? Here's why we have to pump the brakes, because Jesus didn't have the hardest time with the blatant immorality that was happening in his world. He had the hardest time and he saved his harshest words for the self-righteous religious people who looked down their noses at the immoral folks. The people who didn't have the right definition of, uh, of the social issue of their day, who, who didn't get what God reveals from the beginning of creation and Jesus affirms and the Apostle Paul affirms later in the epistles. Original sin, which isn't just the original sin of Adam and Eve, it's the original sin of humanity because that's what Adam's name means. It's our story too. It's not just Garden of Eden, it's 21st century world and the people who reside in it. We bite into the forbidden fruit. And as I'm fond of saying, we don't know it's an apple. I know I just blew some of your minds who are new to hope. It, does, it never says apple. How do you like that? It could have been a pomegranate. So whatever it is that they bit into, it was forbidden. God said to them, he said, look, you can eat. I provided everything in this paradise on earth. You can eat of the fruit of any of the trees in the Garden of Eden. Just don't eat of the tree of the fruit from the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then here comes the enemy of God, Satan, the devil. In the form of a serpent, he comes up to Eve first and he says, he's such a liar. But these lies, it's not like they're hard to believe lies. They're beautifully, you know, sculpted and put together in a way that is so appealing. Hey Eve, 
And eventually, hey, Adam, did God really tell you that if you eat the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that you're going to die? Here's the big lie. You won't die. God just doesn't want you to know things that he knows. He just doesn't want you to have the power he has as if we could create a universe by saying, let there be light. You won't die. Look, let me make this really attractive for you. You can do whatever you want. You can eat the fruit of, you can eat the fruit of any tree in this world. You, you can set up your own system. You can create your own image of God. You, you can define God however you, God can be very small and fit in your neat little box. And in case of emergency, you can break the glass and you can bring them out and say, save me. But short of that, you just do what you want. And God's really nice. And he's going to bless everything that I do. Even if it isn't what scripture reveals I'm supposed to do. Or you're supposed to do. Or especially they're supposed to do. You know, whoever they are for you or for me. The people we prejudge the quickest. That we want to dismiss and demonize. You won't die if you live that way. That's what the world needs. The world needs you to destroy the enemy, even though Jesus says, love your enemies. The world needs you to, 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 to call it a, a war, a culture war. This is a war, even though Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. What does scripture really reveal and what is it that Christians representing God and what it means to be the Imago Dei are telling us it means? The sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. <laughs> feel like Pastor Ben did at Ash Wednesday. Aren't you glad you came to church today to hear this uplifting sermon? The sin of one man, okay, everybody put your harness on, you put, put your belts, pull them tight, because it's, turn the person next to you and say, it's going to get a little bumpy. <laughs> it's like, I already feel like it's pretty bumpy already. There's a lot of turbulence here. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. Let's read it literally in the original text, though. Let me read it for you. For the sin of us, humankind, which is what Adam's name means, causes death to rule over many, which is why there's death in Gaza, there's death in the Ukraine, there's death at the Kansas City Victory Parade for the Chiefs this week. There's, there's all sorts of turmoil and chaos at the border between the U.S. and Mexico. How many more pictures do you want me to put up? This is why we've got what we've got. It's because at the root, it's sin. It's our believing the lies. You won't die. You don't have to be peacemakers. You don't have to be the image of God like that. You don't have to care about people in Africa. You don't have to care about hungry people in Des Moines. You don't have to care about loving your neighbor if they don't have your religion. You don't have to care. You can just kind of ignore them. You don't have to care about your coworkers who see the world differently than you. You can dismiss them because the world is telling you so many different ways, loudly and consistently. Dismiss them, demonize them. Understand they're the problem. The problem is the one who sows seeds of division. The Bible says in Proverbs 6 that there are things that God hates. And do you know what's on the list? People who sow seeds of division in God's creation. People who want to make it all about us and them. And in no way I'm saying that the issues of our day are not worth having passionate, important conversations about, disagreements even, debates. We absolutely should. Our world in so many ways, I'll say it again, has just gone off the rails morally and, and there needs to be a voice that says, you know, I don't know that this is best for us, but it needs to be a truth that's spoken in love or what's our hope of actually making it any better? What's our hope of truly and faithfully reflecting the image of God? If this is where the verse ended, I mean, that would be downright depressing. So because of sin, our world's upside down and it is. Because of sin, everything's messed up and it is. And we have no hope. But the verse goes on. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater, even greater, even, everyone say even greater. Even greater. Shout it out. Say even greater. even greater. I'm talking about the power of the creator of the universe. He brings his great force into the place of darkness in this upside down world. And if anyone can turn an upside down world right side up, it is this God who has the power to speak creation into existence with words. His power, this great power, even greater is the power of God's wonderful grace. Everyone say grace. grace. 
I haven't graduated from it. I hope you don't think you've graduated from it. It's like that's that thing I needed once and now I don't need it anymore because I'm good to go. Pump the brakes again, slow your roll, because that's not what scripture reveals. What it reveals is we all need God's grace, not just them. I do too. You do too. We're all sinners in need of a savior and his gift of righteousness. We have no hope of standing right before a holy God and we will stand before a holy God. One day we will all stand. What is your hope? Talking God out of what he already knows? That I'm a sinner? That you're a sinner? That, that we've all sinned and fall short? Romans 3.23? Or do we put our hope in this Jesus who went to a cross to die for us? And put our sin to death. And if through faith we are joined to this Jesus, the Bible says we are joined to him in a death like his, and we will most certainly also be united with him and joined to him in a resurrection like his. That's your hope. That's my hope. That's our only hope. Our hope is not in being right because of what we do. Our hope is in the grace of this almighty, and he is almighty, this powerful God who sent his son into this world to turn it right side up. And now we are also image of God bearers, the ambassadors that Christ sends out into the world to share this good news. But I'm concerned that so many pockets of Christianity aren't doing that. So many pockets of Christianity have believed the lies of the enemy of God, that the purpose of the church is to talk about them so it makes us feel better about us. And we gain a false confidence and a false hope that our salvation is in our own righteousness, our own morality, our, our own religious behavior and activities, the things we do and they don't do. But that's not what scripture says. It says we've all sinned and fall short and we're ambassadors. We're the messengers of this good news. We're the image of God, the Salam Elohim, the Imago Dei, to tell the world this good news. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. But we have a better God. We have a good God who loves us so much he sent his son into this world to die for us. That if we just believe in him, we will not die, but we'll have everlasting life. Where else are you going to turn? This is what the disciples say to Jesus when Jesus has people leaving because his message is too harsh. And Jesus says, are you going to leave too? And they say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You're the only one who has the words of eternal life. You're our only hope. We know this because we're sinners in need of a Savior. Well, God's making his appeal through us. Who are you telling? Who are you sharing the good news of God's grace with? How are you reflecting the image of God to the world around us? Because it has the power to change people's eternal destinies. And so, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone. I humble myself before people I totally disagree with. Paul says right before this, this verse in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, to the weak I become weak. To those who are Jewish, I, I remind them how Jewish I am. To those who are Gentiles, I follow their rules when I'm with them because their rules aren't the main thing. Because I'm there to try to save some. I'm there to try to win some to Christ. That's what I'm here, that's how I reflect the image of God. If you saw the Super Bowl last week, you probably saw the Super Bowl ads that were put out by a group of Christians called the He Gets Us ads, and, and there's a certain amount of controversy around those and, and all sorts of people, especially on social media. I don't know. I don't know. Social media sometimes, I, that's another sermon for another day. I'm not going to go there. I've got a clock ticking. But there's a, there's a whole place where it's just so divisive. People over on one side of the argument who hate the people over on the other side. And yet they all call themselves Christian. I'm talking about within the church. Within the wider body of Christ around the world. People who are over on one side and they look down their noses at people on the other side. And they, they have a feeling that maybe, just maybe, these ads are being funded by people that they don't like and they've dismissed and demonized. So even though the message is biblical, we have to be against it. Wow, how far we've fallen. People over on the other side who equally hate that side over there, even though we're all part of the same body of Christ. And we forget that our unity in Christ is bigger than anything in this world that could divide us. People over here say, oh, but these ads, 
They're terrible. Where's the repentance? Where's it? You know, when Jesus washed, his, washed people's feet, he didn't wash the feet of obvious sinners like the college kid who comes home and has the, you know, grumpy dad and who, who's, just, who's just apart from Christ and living all sorts of ways and maybe he's done terrible things to the family growing up. You, 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 don't, you don't wash the feet of a sinner like that or a prostitute, or a woman who's had an abortion, or, or, or somebody who has a, a sexual orientation that isn't straight. You don't love people like that. They're the problem. Fill in the blank of whoever's the problem for you. Isn't the mission of the church to be against them? Not in the Bible, it's not. Not at all. What about repentance? Well, well I mean, Jesus didn't wash the feet of sinners. Really? Have you read John 13? Who did he wash the feet of? His disciples. His fully devoted followers. You mean like the unrepentant sinner Judas who was about to betray him? Yeah, he washed his feet. You mean like the denier Peter who denied him in just a few hours? Right after he washed his feet and Peter swore that he'd never deny Jesus? You got the wrong guy. The same Peter that just a few days before Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking of the things of God, but the things of the enemy of God. You mean Thomas, the sinner Thomas, who, had, who, had, who didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead until he had evidence and proof? You mean the other nine sinners who were in line to get their feet washed that day? You mean those disciples? You mean the disciples who routinely, more often than not, got it wrong? who fought over trivial things like who will have the most power in your kingdom when you come into your kingdom, who, who fought over who's getting the most attention, who fought over the way Jesus did things, how he spoke to a woman at the well. Jesus, you can't do that. How, how he, he welcomed children in, into his teaching. You, you can't do that, Jesus. Why? Well, because we have a custom. Yeah, but God is God. Your customs are not God. So I try to find common ground, Paul says, with everyone so that I can save some. That's our mission. And it is miles above any other mission that we could have as the church. And so I really like these ads because they start the conversation. They don't finish it. I maybe wish they would have done more. Show Jesus on the cross, the ultimate love, the ultimate sacrifice. Talk about repentance, but you know, they got a minute. And not everybody's ready for it. I had to feed you with milk, Paul says at one point, because you weren't there yet, you, not with solid food. You, you weren't ready to go off the high dive. You, you needed to be in the shallow waters for a while and, and get your feet wet and get used to it and say, you know, I like swimming. Swimming is really kind of fun. Cool. Let us teach you how to swim even better. Let us, let us lead you to something that's going to transform your swimming life. And you'll be diving off the high dive in no day. You, you'll be snorkeling and scooping and, and swimming with the fish. You're, you're going to have a whole new life opened up to you, son. But it's not time to push you off the high dive and teach you how to swim that way like my dad taught me, and I was not a fan of it. <laughs> I love my dad. That wasn't the best moment. You weren't ready for anything stronger yet. That's where these ads are trying to go. It's where Jesus started with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He didn't start by saying, you know, you've been married a bunch of times, a lot of divorces, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of issues in your past. Let's get those fixed because that's what I'm here to do is the image of God. No, he started with saying, hey, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. Let's, why don't you give me a drink of water? And it's disciples scandalized. You can't speak to her. You're a Jewish man. She's a non-Jewish woman. Our culture says you can't do that. Well, do you follow culture or God? Who gets to be God for you? Do you not realize that it's God's kindness that leads to repentance? You want repentance for all the sinners out there, for them? Well, how many sinners have been led to repentance by shaming them or winning an argument against them or making them feel like they do not belong in God's house until they get their life fixed and figured out, then they can come. 
That's not the foot washing story in John 13. That's not how it worked. That's not the story in John 4. That's not the story in Luke chapter 19 where Jesus comes into Jericho where Zacchaeus is the chief tax collector and he's also the chief sinner. He's a thief and everybody knows it. And Jesus scandalizes the crowd when he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today before you repent. I'm coming to wash your feet, if you will. I'm coming to bring God to you. I'm coming to bring a better life to you because I want it to lead to repentance. Repentance is key. It is essential. It is important. It means transformation. It means living the whole new life. But how do we lead people there? How do we get led there? Well, I think it starts by humbly confessing that sometimes we're a little self-righteous as religious people. It's like the woman who's caught in the sin of adultery. You're like, ah, finally. Jesus told her, go and sin no more. Repent. Yes, he did. But not until he built trust with until he had built trust with her. Not until he had, if you will, washed her feet by shooing away her self-righteous religious accusers who wanted to condemn her to death because she had committed some immoral sin. And clearly they were trying to say she doesn't belong with God's people. And until she figures that out and changes and repents all on her own, then she doesn't get to hang out with us. In fact, we're going to take her whole life so she'll never even have a chance to do that. Wow. It's your kindness, Lord, that leads to repentance. It's your kindness. It's your love. It's reaching out to people who maybe aren't there yet. Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? With that in mind, take another look at these ads, this one ad from the Super Bowl. Ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you. I love your precious heart. I, I was standing. You were there. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. After he set the example of humility and service and love, he told his disciples, now you go and do the same. The difference, of course, is Jesus is the only one who, who never knew any sin. He was the only one who didn't fall. He isn't a part of humankind that fell in the Garden of Eden in original sin like we are. And yet he calls his sinner followers to go out and do the same. One of the most beautiful things about these ads that I didn't catch the first time it's not just the sinners who are having their feet washed who have their shoes off, it's the foot washers who have their shoes off too. To very strongly imply they need to get their feet washed too. We need to have our feet washed too. All of us, starting with me. We're all sinners in need of a savior. Everyone has sinned. We all fall short, yet God in his grace that is amazing makes us right in his sight. The God who has the power to do this, the God who made you, the God who created this universe shows up with the full force of his love poured out through the death of his son, God in the flesh, where he's crucified for the sins of the whole world, not just the sins of the religious self-righteous or the people who get it. No, he does get us. He does understand us and he, to, to get us means to know that we need grace. All of us. Maybe especially the people in the holy huddle who think they've graduated from it. Who don't think they need to repent of that anymore. But we do. We need to repent of our judgmentalism, if nothing else. Everyone has sinned. We all have differences. My sins aren't all yours. Yours aren't all mine. Or the person sitting next to you. And the person sitting next to you is clearly a bigger sinner than you. We all know this. God knows this. But so are you, and so am I, and so are they, and so are we. See, that's the good news. That's the gospel. 
of God's amazing grace that he pours out for us. You can't climb a stairway to heaven. Led Zeppelin knew that. They cried about it all the way through that song. He's buying. He can't get there. You can't, even if you get to the top of being the perfect, moral, religious, righteous person who stands on the right side of every issue, the right side of history, the right side of everything that's right, according to this world, here I am at the top of the religious world. Does that look like it got you to heaven if you make it to the top? Our only hope is in a God who comes down to get us in his amazing grace. Can we boast that we've done anything to be accepted by God? What's the answer, church? No, because our justification, our acquittal, our salvation is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith in a God who loves us so much he did this. And that's what foot washing can lead to. It's the shallow end of the pool that can lead to the deeper swim to discover the kindness that leads to repentance. And a lot of you have, that's your journey. I just described it. You found a church that actually wanted you to be here even before you got your act together. And I would hope that would always be us. That you get to hang out in God's house. Because I as a sinner get to hang out in God's house. God makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Later in the epistles it says, people will know that we are Christians by our rightness on every issue. It doesn't say that. People will know we are Christians because of how moral we are. It doesn't say that. It says the world will notice that we're Christians and be attracted to it by our love. By our love. That's what it means to reflect the image of God. To be the Imago Dei. The Selem Elohim. Is to know that our only hope is God's amazing grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And it's really the only hope of the world. And we have a mission to be the ambassadors, to go out and tell the the world this good news. So we will become all things to all people so that as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, we can save some. This is your mission. I hope you'll choose to accept it. Amen.